Hello, and welcome to Scrap TV, the video forum for the ISRI and Scrap Magazine websites. I'm Kent Kaiser, your Scrap TV host, and today I'm here with Crawford Carpenter, the recently retired manager of national accounts for Karastar, working from Danville, California. Crawford is here today because he's the recipient of the ISRI Lifetime Achievement Award. In addition to having a distinguished career in the papermaking and paper recycling industry, Crawford was a longtime participant in ISRI, filling numerous leadership positions, including serving on the National ISRI Board of Directors, President of the Paper Stock Industries Chapter, Paper Division Board Member, President of the Recycling Research Foundation, and numerous others. First off, welcome Crawford. Thank you. Thank you for joining me here today, and congratulations on your Lifetime Achievement Award. First of all, how does it feel to be a Lifetime Achievement Award winner? Uh, startled, stunned, <laughs> and I really don't know how to react. <laughs> That's about it. But uh, it was, you know, such an honor, and I'm, uh, you know, uh, uh, really in, uh, in, indebted to uh, ISRI and to the Executive Committee. Um, now, you worked full time in the paper making and paper recycling industry for almost 46 years. Can you tell me what were some of your most defining memories, greatest uh, milestones, or accomplishments in that period of your career? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I can think of what you go back to uh, paper stock operations from tab cards uh, to um, what? There are no longer tab cards. And you think about many of the things that uh, uh, went on in, in those uh, you know, old years, so to speak. Um, it, it was interesting because when you first started, everything was based on a personal relationship. And it was based on shaking hands, eyeball to eyeball, and to get to know either your customer or your supplier. And nowadays, it's really not that way. And I think it's the electronic media and the real key now is uh, you better get with it or you're going to get left behind. And whether it's internet, webinar, uh, broadband, you name it, uh, uh, you've got to do it. And that keeps you current. Mm -hmm. And um, I would say, you know, a world of difference from the way business used to be uh, conducted versus the way business is conducted now. And uh, particularly in, in the area where I specialized recently on national accounts, Amazing, be it Macy's, Target, Walmart, Super Value, and you can go on and on. It's all internet bids. And you really don't see an emphasis on service or an emphasis on quality. What I tend to think now is that they're just chasing the almighty buck. And previously, where a company or many of the companies that are in our uh, particular industry, you could sell service and you could back that up. And now it's money, money, money. And um, exporters and uh, export, I would say, companies are making a uh, tremendous push for many of the large national accounts. And that's primarily because they're such huge sources of material. And that feeds their uh, almost insatiable uh, uh, appetite that those mills have overseas. So uh, that, that, I think that that's kind of it. How about in the materials themselves? I mean, I know paper, the paper stream has changed so much over the years. How, how did you see it change most notably? Well, I'd say the um, you know biggest thing you know happened to be the emphasis on quality. And, and I think when waste haulers started getting into the recycling business, because there was a time when a waste hauler was a waste hauler, and somebody in the paper business was really in the paper business. I think we in paper, uh, in the paper business per se, uh, did an outstanding job relative to quality. And this isn't, you know, this isn't a fault of the waste haulers, but they have kind of a, a different metric. Theirs is push tons through to lower your cost per ton. And I don't think there was a heavy emphasis on quality. And I think when you ran into many of the rejects or the major rejects that may have happened 10, 15 years ago, and some may be going on today, they were a result of poor quality coming from, be it a MRF, be it a uh, major recycling facility from a waste hauler. 
And um, I, I think that has been, you know, kind of a difficulty for them. But with their difficulty, then uh, the particular customers would say, well, gee whiz, a paper stock plant may have the same issues. And 90% of the time, a paper stock plant would not have those issues. You devoted many years as a volunteer leader in ISRI's paper stock industries chapter. Can you tell me why did you think it was so important to be involved in that way? Uh, see, no, that started from my boss, and my boss back then was Johnny Gold, and not only was he my boss, he was my friend, and he said, you know what, hey, things are changing, and we got to be at the table, and he said he, you know, because of, he was at a higher level than I was, he said, uh, uh, hey, I'm going to be tied up with these other things, but we need somebody that can, uh, uh, what is it, get at the table and represent us, and at that time, it was Newark. And uh, the Newark group was a very, very strong supporter of ISRI, saw a, a very uh, definite need for ISRI, particularly on specs, the paper stock specifications, and how you conduct yourself in the business world. And it was all about being first class in the way you conduct yourself. And uh, I think, I just thought it was, it was so neat to get involved. And, you know, I just started as a, uh, you know, God, I'm trying to think. I started, believe it or not, I was on the convention committee of PSI, and I got ticked off, and I said to, well, I think it was Nene Creever, and I said to Nene, hey, I'm on the convention committee, and nobody ever called me for anything. I said, and, you know, all you people are running around here asking for people to do stuff. I said, you know, this is kind of a joke. <laughs> and she, she took it to heart. And then I think the next two-year cycle, or the, a year later, she said, uh, we want you to join the PS cha uh, PSI chapter as our membership chair. I said, you're kidding me. She said, nope. She said, you complain, now go do something. <laughs> and it was fabulous. Uh, we were able to um, increase our membership. We got a good team of people together, and that really started it. I went from the membership chair, and then after that, what was it, secretary, treasurer, vice president, and then leading the chapter. And, uh, it was a wonderful ride. <laughs> well, now, besides being president of the PSI chapter, do you have any other highlights or real uh, gr great memories from all your meetings you attended for PSI or just things you did as a, as a group? Well, I would say, um, you know, let's do PSI first. Um, I think we got PSI rolling. Um, there were, I would say there was a span of about six years where our membership was uh, dwindling. And a group of us got together when we were in the various positions, and we really pushed membership. Uh, I know that was uh, the forte that I had at the time, and I believe I was followed by George Chen, and then we were again followed by one or two other people, then Leonard Zide, and all of those individuals have become major players and uh, have been in that chain to lead the PSI chapter as the president. Sure. Yeah, so, um, so I would say from that vantage point, um, uh, that was you know, probably a significant you know, accomplishment. And as I moved to ISRI, um, uh, ISRI was an uh, uh, overwhelming experience initially. You know, I'd never you know, been part of any large trade association. And what I found with the ISRI people is I absolutely loved how relaxed and casual they were. And I'm kind of more of a laid back type person. So that, you know, I said, you know, there's a fit here. And what I also liked was the friendliness. And I was surprised at how open so many people were that didn't know me and that came up and introduced themselves. And I said, you know what, there's gotta be something to this group. And um, I'd say the, probably the primary thing that uh, I think, uh, you know, from an achievement sam uh, standpoint, uh, from a group of us, and, you know, particularly at the Recycling Research Foundation, um, we did a lot of things on scholarships, be it graduate scholarships. We had this, the fellowships, and we kind of nurtured those programs along. And I've got to tip my hat, and not to somebody at ISRI, but it's to my wife, because we were watching a TV show about veterans or some darn thing. And my wife kind of looked at me, and this was about, what, two years? About two years ago, two and a half years ago, whatever. 
And she said, you know, you should do something. Then she went on reading her book, thinking about something else. And I said, that was a heck of an idea. And I got with Paul Brenner, and Paul Brenner has a son, I believe, that's uh, in the Air Force uh, currently. And I said, Paul, let's get together and see if we can drive this board <laughs> and push them and nudge them a little bit, and let's get a scholarship for veterans. And we geared it towards the enlisted uh, individuals. Uh, you know, not that I have anything against officers, I was one, but we said, let's get the enlisted troops and let's help these young men and young women and let's see what we can do. And by George, the board jumped all over it and we had tremendous support from the other board members. And I would say something to tip your hat to would be the uh, veterans you know, stipend slash scholarship. Uh, glad we did that. Excellent, oh, that sounds very noble. Um, okay, now that you're retired, um, first of all, what will you miss about being in the, uh, the recycling game and uh, how do you plan to spend your time? Uh, I don't miss getting up early for conference calls, <laughs> so I don't miss that. <laughs> And I'd say maybe the thing that, that you, you, you miss initially is it's like you're geared up. And it's like, it's like you gotta bring it down a notch or two. Because, so to speak, you're in the game and the phone's ringing. Somebody is either calling you or emailing you or texting you. It's like you're going, 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 going. And um, you don't have that, but if you get your schedule laid out the right way, you can, you know, supplement, uh, you know, supplement those, you know, various times and activities. And I know you have in your history done a lot of athletic stuff. Uh, I mean, how do you plan to spend your time in retirement? Are you going to be doing some more of your favorite sports or oh, traveling? Yeah. Well, you know, my, my current schedule is I play tennis on Saturday mornings at 8 o'clock, Sunday mornings at 8 o'clock. Then my wife and I, we, uh, her deal when we moved to California is we had to go to lunch every Saturday. So we have to do that. We've got a group of friends that we do that with and we solve the problems of the world on Saturdays around noontime. And uh, uh, Sunday, it's, uh, well, I'm a big football fan. So I play tennis and I'm watching football or baseball and fooling around with grandkids. And then Monday, I, first thing I do is I start with a two mile power walk and then after that, whatever the day brings, it brings. Tuesdays, I practice tennis again with my uh, partner that I play with quite a bit. And that's generally two and a half, three hours because we kind of lounge around afterwards. So we've got time. And then Wednesdays, I power walk again two miles. <laughs> and Thursday, we play tennis again. So, <laughs> so no, I'm busy. <laughs> and in between all of that, I'm having a ball going to Little League games, which I didn't have a chance to attend before because they're early afternoon. And my granddaughter, I have a chance to go to her basketball games. I didn't realize she was so good. I knew she was good academically, but I didn't realize she's very good athletically. And she played on the freshman basketball school, I mean team at her school. Uh, and so uh, it's good to go there and to be with the, the kids and the family. Well, thank you for joining me here today, Crawford, and congratulations again on your Lifetime Achievement Award. For Scrap TV, I'm Kent Kaiser, signing off for now.